Hello, uh, welcome to the Voyage of the Monk podcast, if that is what we decide to call it. We haven't decided yet. I'm Fawn. I'm Alice, or Red. And we are going to be talking about the Voyage of St. Brendan the Navigator. If you don't know who St. Brendan is, let me tell you. St. Brendan the Navigator was an abbot in County Kerry around about the 6th century. He was famous throughout Europe for his voyages, but today he's really only known for one voyage, and that would be the time that he sailed to heaven. <laughs> Some people speculated that St. Brendan did not, in fact, sail to heaven and actually reached America. <laughs> Imagine. In fact, adventurer Tim Severin built a reproduction of the kind of boat that would have been used in the period with period supplies and sailed the, ro- the route that people imagine was the one Brendan took to America, just to prove it was possible. However, a lot of scholars aren't really fans of these attempts to map the locations from the story onto real-world places, as they distract from the actual point, which is the themes of salvation, piety, and asceticism that we get from the Christian elements, and the themes of discovery and wonder that come from the distinctly Irish elements of the story. As St. Brendan's story is a fusion of two things. Imrama stories and Catholic asceticism. Imrama stories are characterised by long voyages out to sea, where the protagonists encounter lots of strange creatures and adventures, often arriving at some kind of otherworld. These include the voyage of Maeldun, the voyage of Bran, and one could even argue that the arrival of the Milesians in Ireland from on Lower Gawala Éireann is a form of Imrama story. But there was also a tradition amongst Christian monks of isolating themselves in the desert so they could be more at one with God. Of course, Ireland doesn't have many deserts. Though there is the Burren, which is a limestone desert, but if every monk in the country went and isolated themselves in the Burren, they wouldn't be isolated for very long. But we do have a fuck ton of sea, so Irish monks would often go off sailing for days or weeks at a time, or go live on islands to get that same sense of isolation. So St. Brendan's Voyage is where we see those two traditions kind of get slapped together. So what we'll be doing in this podcast is I will be summarising parts of the story. Uh, I am a folklorist and storyteller. I studied Irish folklore at UCD. I've been a professional storyteller for roughly five years. uh, And I've lived in Ireland my entire life. Uh, So I will be explaining all of this for Red. I am a digital artist and writer and (laughs) community manager. I have lived in Ireland for five years and I very much do not have a folklore education. (laughs) Who has no cultural context? Not a single bit. So she'll be offering commentary from an outside perspective. Uh, One last thing before we begin. I'm using a a translation of the text edited by Simon Webb. Webb modernized the spellings of a 15th century text by William Caxton, which in turn was a translation Caxton made of a 13th century text by Jacobus de Voragine. We're using this version of the text because it's the one I have. So if you have any problems with the content of the text, don't take that up with me. Talk to Simon Webb, then William Caxton, then Jacobus de Verogine. <laughs> I feel like that's kind of a polite way of saying, fuck off. Especially since the last two are dead. Like, <laughs> extremely dead. <laughs> Alright, so, without further ado. Alright, fire shall we away. Get started? St. Brendan was the abbot of a thousand monks. He lived in great penance and abstinence and governed his monks virtuously. So he was no fun? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, cool, it was, got that covered. It was ascetic AF. <laughs> <laughs> but one day St. Bre- uh, but one day St. Berinthus came to visit. Uh, St. Brendan was telling him about the things he had seen on his voyages, basically what he'd done on his holidays, and St. Berenthus began to cry. (laughs) (laughs) So, St. Brendan says, and this this is a direct quote, Ye came hither for to be joyful with me, 
and therefore for God's love leave your mourning and tell me what marvels you have seen in the great sea ocean. Basically, for the love of God, stop crying. <laughs> Why is he crying? <laughs> I don't understand. People cry a lot in this. Um, and it's mostly like when they're told or hear about something incredibly beautiful, um, incredibly joyful, they will start crying. Um, I think it's it's mostly supposed to be tears of joy, though that's rarely stated. But that's what it it, it, it feels like. I mean, I really appreciate men who are in touch with their softer side. Go off. <laughs> so, St. Brendan tell No. Two B fucking saints. St. <laughs> Berinthus tells Brendan what he did on his holidays, but he still can't stop crying. He explains that his son, Murnoch, who was apparently a very famous monk, really wanted to find a good island where he could isolate himself and be closer to God. So Berinthus tol had told Murnoch to sail to an island far out to sea beside the Mountains of Stone. Murnoch sailed out there with his monks, and together they served the Lord devoutly. <laughs> but then we have to go into the, um, yeah, yeah, Berinthus has a vision, and I'm just going to read the vision out directly from the text. Okay. And then Berinthus saw in a vision that this monk Murnoch was sailed right far eastward into the sea, more than three days sailing. And suddenly to his seeming, there came a dark cloud and overcovered them. That a great part of the day they saw no light, and as our Lord would, the cloud passed away, and they saw a full fair island, and thitherward they drew. In that island was joy and mirth enough, and all the earth of that island shined as bright as the sun. And there were the fairest trees and herbs that ever any man saw, and there were many precious stones shining bright. And every herb there was full of flowers, and every tree full of fruit, so that it was a glorious sight and a heavenly joy to abide there. Okay. <laughs> okay, so obviously what happens next is a beautiful young man shows up who knows all of their names. <laughs> he tells them to thank Jesus that they were brought to the land of paradise. Okay. And he tells the monks that they've been on the island for six months. But because they hadn't had to sleep or eat or drink, and the sun had never set, the monks thought they had only been there for half an hour. I'm, mm, you know, I feel like even if you hadn't eaten or drinking or slept, you would be able to still feel time passing. But it's just such a happy place. They were just so happy. You know, like six months flies when you're having fun. Yeah, apparently. well, they say the same thing at Disney World, but you can still feel yourself walking around for six hours. <laughs> Pop the fuck on. <laughs> but yeah, they, they also, when they hear this news, they start to cry. Yeah, yeah, well, shit, I would too. <laughs> but out of joy, because, wow! No! <laughs> Six months felt like half an hour no. in this beautiful land. I thought they were only supposed to be gone for like a week. <laughs> what if they had a pet cat? <laughs> that cat's dead. Oh no, not Pangerbon. Who? <laughs> what? There, we'll, 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 we'll cover it some other time, but there's this there's this old poem. Okay. Very old. Um, written by an Irish monk. Um, about him and his cat. Um, uh, his his pet cat is named Pangerbon, which basically means white cat. Okay. Um, and he's like, well, my cat is just there hunting for mice, and I'm here sitting at my desk hunting for words, and we do we're doing the same thing really, and it's just really nice sitting here with my cat, both of us doing our jobs. I would die for this. <laughs> Anyways, <laughs> Saint Brendan's friend's nephew or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so he then tells them that there's an other island next to this one. Oh, a whole other island now. But they're not allowed to go there. 
No humans are allowed on that island. Listen, buddy, you had to know that that was going to instigate some bullshit. Well, it didn't. It didn't. They they were they were perfectly okay with that. Okay. But um, there is a little bit that's a little unclear in this in this um in this version. Um, there's a line that says, "This is the place that Adam and Eve dwelt in first. But it's not really clear whether he's talking about the island they're on or the island they're not allowed to go to. Uh-huh. But one of them is literally the Garden of Eden. Okay. Uh, shit. Who knew that the Garden of Eden was just hanging off the coast of Ireland? Oh no, it's 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 really far away. Oh. Well, maybe. There, there, there's there's so much speculation on where these islands actually are. Good ass questions, huh? Um, we might bring up some maps next time and take a look at them. Okay. Um. All right, but then he says it's time for them to go. Okay, bye. So the monks, they all get back on their boat. And then as as they're like getting ready to push off, they're, they're looking at the beach and your man vanishes. As one does. Yeah, the, the, the beautiful young man just disappears. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. It's the power of gay. <laughs> so they set off and they arrive. And so they set off and you'll never guess where they land. Shit, tell me. Brendan's Abbey. What? <laughs> uh, this is a bit weird because um, I think it's the O'Donoghue translation, uh, where um, Saint Brantus actually went off with Murnoch and the others, and then came back to Brendan. Okay. Um, but in this version, um, Saint Brantus had a vision of Murnoch and the others going off. And then when they come back, they immediately land at Brendan's Abbey. <laughs> Just coincidentally. Okay. All right, sure. <laughs> so they tell him about, all about their trip to paradise. And Brendan's monks knew it was true because they could smell paradise on their clothes. What does paradise smell like? I don't know. It just gets described as like fragrant and stuff like that, which is... And sweet smelling as well, so I guess kind of sweet. Okay, but sweet could be anything. Yeah, I know it could. I need details. What does paradise smell like? <laughs> so then just then Brendan decided, fuck it, we're sailing to heaven. You know, as you do. So he built a ship and he stocked it for seven years. How <laughs> was there enough boats? <laughs> What? How is there enough boat for seven years worth of food? <laughs> and water. Water is heavy. See, in, in the O'Donoghue translation, it says that um, it says that he only stocked it for 40 days voyage. That's a big gap. <laughs> there, there is quite a difference between 40 days and seven years. I mean, I, I don't feel like that's like, oh, you know, the difference between 40 days or 60 days. That's 40 days and seven fucking years. <laughs> What's... So, seven years, that's 365 times seven. So, we're well into the thousands. And let's divide that by 40. I mean, just the seven by 300 is over 2,100. Exactly. <laughs> and divide that by... Like, that's a huge... That's We're talking, like... <laughs> like 10 times the amount of that figure out your fucking math (laughs) that's all i gotta say about that hey this is editing fun uh i just noticed that what with the mathematics of it all i forgot to mention that the version with the uh 40 days uh with the, the voyage being expected to last 40 days is obviously a reference to Jesus spending 40 days and 40 nights in the desert. It's it's based on that. That's where that comes from. That's what that idea is about. Uh, it just got driven out of my head while we were recording. Uh, I did want to mention it, though. So there you are. Here it is. That's me doing it now. Cheers. <laughs> <laughs> And the um the O'Donoghue translation though it also tells us how they made the boat. Okay. Which the um there a lot of people speculate that Jacobus um who was the the original kind of 
writer of this version of the story. The the person who uh, made the Latin translation that got translated back into English and then transliterated into modern English. Um, that he just thought how they built their boat was boring, so he left it out. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Fuck your carpenters. This is boring. But the uh or or possibly he found it unbelievable or something. I don't know. Okay. But the O'Donohue translation says that Brendan built the ship. Uh he he and the monks they used iron tools, fair enough. They made it with wicker sides and wicker ribs, covered it with cowhide, tanned in oak bark, and then used that as well to for tarring the joints. Okay. Which is um like that that is how curracks are made. They're a kind of uh they're a kind of boat primarily used off on the west coast at the moment. Okay. Um So it tracks, it holds up. Yeah, and that's that's what Tim Severin did when when he sailed to fucking I think it was Canada he sailed to from Ireland. Okay. <laughs> But yeah, that that is the the opening of Saint Brendan's Voyage. I think I think we can leave it there for now. I think that's a good that's a good starting point. Any yeah, thoughts? I, this is gonna be a fucking ride. <laughs> <laughs> I have so many questions. Well, go on. <laughs> Why is there such a huge discrepancy in the days he stalked for? <laughs> <laughs> Why was there just a random beautiful man on this island? I think I'm not sure who the beautiful man was. Nobody is. That's the problem. <laughs> what? It could have been an angel. Um didn't have 82 eyes, 0 out of 10. <laughs> they can take on other forms. No. Um it could have been an angel. It could have been Jesus referring to himself in the third person. Okay. Um, like a wrestler. Um, like, you see, the the problem is, is that I'm not religious. Mm -hmm. So any sort of, like, religious reverence that is experienced in this book, I'm going to take the absolute piss out of. <laughs> because, I like... I do my best to respect religion, mm -hmm. but at the same time, sometimes it's just you're you're taking the piss like, come on. So there's there's a lot of pre-Christian elements built into this. Uh-huh. Um you you'll see as we go forward. And there's also um one of the main Christian themes throughout it. Like I I talked about salvation and piety as well, but the main one is asceticism. In fact, like, the salvation and the piety, they are achieved through asceticism. So fucking dramatic. And for anyone listening who, who is unaware of what asceticism is... I didn't know what it was, so you're good. Um, uh, well, I think the best way for you to picture asceticism is Matt Murdock. Matt Murdock, listen... <laughs> Um. Them Catholics love to fucking suffer. They do. <laughs> it's their favorite thing to do because God forbid they're not quote unquote oppressed in some way. Asceticism is a religious idea that um, kind of suffering and self-denial, self-discipline is the best path to salvation or enlightenment or various different things depending on the belief system it's being used in. Uh, um, asceticism is also in other non-Christian religions. It's in Buddhism and a few others as well. But um, the Irish Catholic asceticism um, gets... I, I can't speak on asceticism in other cultures, but the Irish Catholic asceticism is extremely competitive. As you will see through the rest of this story, um, <laughs> um, it, it kind of becomes its own form of pride, in a way. <laughs> it's so, it's so fucking ridiculous to me because you're suffering for the sake of suffering, right? Whereas, like, if you wanted to prove piety, if you wanted to prove that you were a good person through suffering, why don't you do suffering that has a point? Why don't you, like, go work in a field? 
Why don't you build houses for the poor? Why don't you work in a soup kitchen? That's gonna be hard fucking work. And you will be suffering while you're doing it. But also helping people. So, like, get over yourself. See, um, some forms of scat- of some ascetics do do that kind of thing. Yeah, and, like, more power to them. But what we're hearing about here, it's just like, let me fuck off in the middle of nowhere just to say that I did it. Yeah, the, the, the form of ascetism that requires extreme isolation to me comes across as somewhat self-indulgent. It's extremely self-serving. You're not doing anything to, like, further yourself as a person, really. Mm-hmm. And, like, isn't that what religion should be about? Making yourself a better person? And making your experiences better for the people around you? Well, like, they do think that the isolation makes them better people. Like... <laughs> like, I genuinely don't want to be disrespectful to religious people because, you know, if that is what makes you happy, if that what makes you feel safe, and if it makes you a better person, by all means, go right ahead. But this element to it, the self-serving, overly proud, absolute fuckery, it... <laughs> that's, that's, that's my, that's my take. <laughs> Please don't cancel me. <laughs> well, I think, I think we're being very plain that we're focusing on the Irish Catholic Church. Yes. Um, I, so... I, I make no blanket statements or comments on other religions. I have yeah. very little experience with them, so... We don't know how asceticism is practiced in other faiths, so we, we literally cannot comment on it. I, I, I comment solely on the, the facets of asceticism that we read about and learn about within the Voyage of St. Brendan. Yeah, it, 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 re- it reminds me of the... Um... There was this bit in a in a Darrow Brian stand up show uh-huh. where um, someone came up to him apparently in at the end of another show and said, "Oh, you'll make jokes about the Catholics, you'll make jokes about the Protestants, <laughs> but you won't make fun of the Muslims, will you? <laughs> you won't touch them." And Darrow Brian says, "Like, no, you're right. I won't make jokes about Muslims, and there's two reasons for that. One." I don't know a thing about Muslims, uh-huh. and two, neither do you. That's so fucking lutely. <laughs> Listen, I'll take the piss of Catholicism or Christianity any fucking day. I grew up in the United States. Like, come on. But the other ones, no. I, I don't. I don't know a damn thing. I surely do not. Anyway, um, I think we can wrap it up. For, for, for episode one there. Yeah, um, sounds good. We, we went on a bit of a ramble. But, um, <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, asceticism going to be coming up a lot in the rest of this book. So if you want to hear more about self-suffering monks, uh, tune in next time. Same monk time, same monk channel. <laughs> this is a monk channel now? I guess. I think that's our sign-off now. <laughs> <laughs> God help us. Goodbye. <laughs>